Hello, my name is Michael Danish Meyer. I'm coming to you from uh, Auckland, New Zealand. It's an absolute pleasure to be able to present to you my topic for today, which is peri implant tissue management around immediate implants. I'm a specialist periodontist uh, here in New Zealand uh, in private practice. Uh, have held previous academic appointments at the Otago University in New Zealand uh, School of Dentistry as well as at Temple University um, and currently run both a private practice as well as a clinical training institute um, here in New Zealand. So let's get to our topic for the day, uh, peri-implant tissues around immediate implants. And I'm sure most of you will be well aware of what an immediate implant is relative to traditional um, uh, implant placement, sometimes referred to as type 1 placement. Uh, in essence, it's the time, uh, the time relative to the tooth extraction. So immediate implant placements are done uh, at the same time as the tooth is removed, either with or without an immediate provisional crown. And while not a new technique, uh, it's been around since the 1990s, it has certainly gained popularity in the last decade or so. Immediate implants do represent a significant clinical challenge and I feel it's important for us as clinicians to look carefully at each case and make a critical assessment, uh, both an assessment of risk, as you can see here. These are some guidelines provided by the ITI organisation which are extremely helpful in helping to determine what case type you're dealing with. Another very helpful uh, classification is that of the SAC classification. Uh, also from ITI and you can see here that the immediate implants would fall into what I would consider to be the complex uh, category. So it's a common misconception that immediate implants are relatively straightforward. Uh, they are in fact quite uh, clinically demanding. So what are the benefits or advantages of immediate implant placement? Well, they are, have a reduced treatment time for patients. They generally involve fewer surgical appointments. Uh, reduce surgical morbidity and in some cases can provide the patient with immediate aesthetics and uh, also function. But of course, as with any clinical procedure, there are also downsides and where we need to do significant uh, regeneration of the bone through GBR or soft tissue augmentation, generally immediate implants are not an option. Uh, also, we need to have good bone support to allow for a higher primary stability of our implants. If that can't be achieved, immediate implants, again, not an option. Uh, it is more clinically demanding, requires strict patient compliance, and sometimes can be somewhat more costly for patients uh, moving forward. So when considering an immediate implant, I would like to draw our, or focus our attention now on the gap. Now this is either an osseous gap or a soft tissue gap. And we're going to look at the osseous gap in the first instance. And a question that was often asked with immediate implants when they first came onto the scene was, well, surely the implant itself, placing that into the socket will help to preserve the bone. And so that was a commonly held belief for many years, but unfortunately proved to be incorrect. And this very elegant study by Arjo et al helped to illustrate and, and, and really, um, I guess, shed the light on what happens particularly to the buccal plate um, and immediate implant placement. The reality is, is that uh, the implant does not prevent buccal bone resorption. And so the bundle bone that was associated with the tooth and its periodontal ligament still undergoes resorption, regardless of whether the implant is there or not. And so this wasn't really that well understood initially. And uh, what are the clinical consequences of that? Well. Unfortunately, they are not great. Marginal recession, loss of labial bone contour resulting in shadowing or food retention, um, and also uh, the loss of buccal bone potentially resulting um, in uh, underlying bony dehiscences um, and therefore overlying soft tissue problems. So it's something to be very mindful of. And if we look at the clinical implications or clinical uh, consequences, here you can see a case that was an immediate implant uh, more than eight years ago. Uh, we sometimes end up with something that doesn't look quite as good as it did uh, at the onset. And uh, you can see a loss of labial bone resulting in a loss of uh, tissue contour resulting in an aesthetic problem. Um, and as my good friend and colleague Dr. Peter Worley said many years ago, the bone sets the tone, but the tissue uh, is the issue from an aesthetic 
standpoint. And we can see here also looking at it occlusally that we have a uh, significant defect labially um, as a result of that loss of the underlying bony plate, which the implant alone has not managed to maintain. Um, so without appropriate management of that osseous jump gap, we will get loss of the buccal bone. We will get overlying soft tissue recession, and that's been illustrated in a number of cases here. We can see um, as a result of that, uh, illustrated in studies of like Khan and Chen and Evans. Uh, and this um, uh, systematic review from Chen and Boozer, you can see that there is consistency across the board uh, of facial recession on immediate implants where the osseous jump gap uh, was not managed. So really we need to be mindful of the gap um, that uh, is a result of the mismatch in diameter of the tooth being extracted um, and the implant being placed and somehow offset the remodeling of that buccal bone by undertaking osseous grafting. So we need to um, think about this. Um, the osseous grafting is principally to the buccal given that immediate implants are typically placed palatally, as you can see illustrated here. So with the type one placement, we're um, generally aiming for the implant to be positioned more palatal, which leaves us with this gap uh, and this uh, vulnerable uh, buccal plate. So we need to graft this gap uh, in order to compensate for the loss of the buccal bone, which is the bundle bone, which will inevitably uh, remodel uh, following the loss uh, of the tooth. And in this uh, very elegant study by Arjo et al, you can see again the, uh, the evidence. And so where um, they looked at uh, extractions and immediate implant placement, either with uh, grafting of the jump gap or not grafting. And you can see um, clearly on the control site where no grafting was undertaken, there is a loss uh, of that bone, as you would expect. Um, whereas on the test site where a, a, um, a xenograft was placed, you can see under higher power, the xenograft clearly supports new bone formation as well as osseointegration uh, on the simplar. Uh, so that's very encouraging. Which leads us to the next question, and that is, well, what sort of bone graft material should we really be using in the jump gap? And it's really a matter of assessing materials based on their origins, whether they have an, uh, an osteogenic potential or not, and also what the resorption profile of that material is. So we ideally want a material that is small particulate size, that it supports osseointegration by being osseoconductive and that it is slowly resorbable. Um, and the material of choice here really is really a xenograft. And um, this nice histological slide illustrates that nicely. It's a study that's currently impressed by Ellis uh, et al. And uh, they used bioos or a xenograft bioos uh, and a collagen sponge to contain the graft um, uh, on this particular study. Um, xenograft materials have been around for a long time. You can see here these photomicrographs clearly illustrating the osseoconductiveness of the material with direct apposition of bone um, onto the uh, actual um, uh, bioos itself. The other nice feature, of course, with the xenograft is the, uh, is the slowly resorbing nature of the material. Uh, and this helps to uh, compensate uh, for that uh, buccal plate loss. The clinical effects of this are essentially enhanced aesthetics. So we can see here even many years after immediate implant placement where there was grafting undertaken to, into the jump gap, we have this moderating effect of the graft um, uh, in terms of the buccal plate loss, which therefore helps to maintain more stable marginal gingival tissue and a better aesthetics long term. And there are a number of studies now that uh, support uh, this just a couple here to illustrate it by Sands and Khan uh, to illustrate the benefits of this uh, slowly resorbable xenograft uh, in the jump gap. In more recent times, a technique known as the socket shield technique has been discussed. Um, this is where a small portion of root is actually left behind and the implant is placed into the remaining portion of the extraction site. Um, this technique is very clinically challenging. Um, there is not really a lot of good long-term data on this and um, some papers uh, such as the one illustrated here is, um, says that some higher degree of complications are encountered with this technique uh, and therefore it can result in more unpredictable aesthetic results. So a word of caution, it's not a technique that I personally use at the practice um, but something to be uh, aware of. 
So as well as the hard tissue defect, what about the soft tissue gap? We want to try to preserve um, that contour as much as we can um, through the course of the treatment. And really there are three options that we can look at uh, to help us with this, either coronally advancing a flap, um, some form of collagen matrix or mucograft seal, for example, or connective tissue graft could potentially be utilized. And each of these uh, techniques has its own um, uh, benefits and, and, and shortcomings. Um, and we're going to focus our attention just on the use of the collagen matrix, the mucograft seal in this case, and the connective tissue graft. Um, there are different uh, case types there which suit both these materials, and I want to try to um, uh, highlight this uh, with uh, illustrating a few cases. For those of you not familiar with the mucograft seal, it's a bilaminar collagen matrix uh, with a compact structure um, on one surface and a spongious uh, structure on the other. Uh, sort of mimicking the uh, the epithelium and the connective tissue uh, of the uh, of the flap. In terms of its positioning around an immediate implant, this uh, diagram serves to illustrate how we would orientate the material um, at the uh, soft tissue gap, um, helping to contain the particulate graft within the uh, osseous jump gap uh, and to support the uh, the buccal flap or the soft tissues around this uh, implant with a uh, healing abutment in place. And so clinically, we need to modify uh, the mucograft seal. Um, we utilize a hole punch to create a crescent or a scallop, um, which um, then allows us to place the material um, partly beneath the, um, the, the mini flap, um, but the dense portion can be left exposed to the oral environment. This is the same case, just illustrating the process uh, of healing abutment placement and then um, the positioning and placement of the mucograft seal, the crescent. Closure, very important that you don't put too much compression on the soft tissues, so passive closure, in this case with some Teflon sutures. Another case just illustrating again the technique used on this failing uh, post core crown on the 1-1. So you can see implant placement, um, the grafting of the osseous grafting of the jump gap on that uh, a buccal aspect, um, followed by um, the soft tissue gap management. So very minimal flap reflection here um, to cause minimal disruption. But note also the uh, the nature of the soft tissue, um, which we'll have a look at again shortly. So there you can see the positioning uh, or the draping of the mucograft seal around the uh, healing abutment containing the graft uh, and from the labial aspect again. Um, supporting that soft tissue. So, but note the stippling, note this favorable gingival biotype on these kinds of cases. These are the ones uh, where you could potentially contemplate the use of the seal. Passive closure, three months healing. At this stage, we're placing a new healing abutment, a wider healing abutment, but you can see how the mucograft seal has facilitated the maintenance of volume, uh, tissue height uh, from the labial as well as volume. If you look at it from the occlusal aspect, again, we can see some good soft tissue uh, volume uh, in this area, which will ultimately uh, help enhance the aesthetic outcome uh, for this case. So again, just the technique illustrated on another case. Um, you can see there again, the modification of the mucograft seal, the shape of it to allow better adaptation. And again, following osseo integration three months later, we can see that the marginal tissue heights are very favorable. Um, and also looking at it from an occlusal standpoint, we can see there that we've managed to um, help maintain some good, some good volume in the area. So um, a very useful, a useful tool. Now, here we can see a, another important point to remember is that when we're doing any soft tissue work around implants, make sure you don't have a tissue supported prosthesis always ensure it is tooth supported so that you don't put pressure or you don't squash the tissue um, during that critical healing phase. Now, if you have a case where the soft tissue has a poor biotype or where the tissue volume is insufficient or you need primary closure, well then really the use of the mucograft seal is, is inappropriate and you need to consider the use of the tried and proven connective tissue graft. So whether it be from the palate uh, or if you need something more dense and more fibrous from the tuberosity, the connective tissue graft is a very useful uh, technique to increase volume in particular 
and uh, to support soft tissue, the peri-implant soft tissue around immediate implants. But it does involve obviously a second surgical site. So indications for the connective tissue graft, obviously pre-existing recession and soft tissue def defects, thin gingival biotype where you need increased thickness or volume and also to assist you with primary closure. And you can see I'm illustrated on this clinical case where there's already pre-existing recession um, and we're planning an immediate implant here. You know, this is a very challenging case and the, the, the nature of the thin nature of the biotype here necessitates the need for a connective tissue graft so that by the time we come to um, uh, uncovering the implant with the healing abutment there, as you can see at the end, we've managed to boost the amount of biotype, that, sorry, boost the amount of tissue volume, prove the biotype and ultimately get a better outcome. Again, in this case, you can see pre-existing recession um, this case, the 1 1 has failed uh, due to endodontic failure. The 2 1 is receiving a new crown. But again, the use of connective tissue to increase volume uh, to ensure that we have good um, tissue height, both um, horizontally as well as vertically. Uh, through the course of healing, we can see that taking shape. And as we come to doing second stage surgery, um, you can see there occlusally we have very nice um, width of tissue and so we move forward with uncovering healing abutment placement and in this case also using a temporary uh, crown to start some tissue sculpting by using a carefully uh, designed emergence profile um, and, and really trying to maximize the aesthetic outcome with the volume that we've managed to gain uh, by using uh, this connective tissue grafting technique. So you can see there just a radiograph of the uh, temporary crown. So as we move through the sequence, you can see here now the Luxatemp crown in place following a, a, a month or so of healing. And uh, we then have the final restorations. This is unfortunately at the day of insertion. So the soft tissues do look a slightly uh, irritated um, but nevertheless, uh, nice tissue volume, nice tissue height, nice symmetry between the two uh, uh, teeth. Now, uh, Dr. Inyaki Gabarina has also um, uh, designed and developed this slim abutment, which we use on occasion to help support and control the position uh, of the connective tissue graft. And this can be used in immediates as well. Um, it's a very nice uh, technique. Um, whereby we can help the um, stabilization of the connective tissue where we want it by using these, uh, these slim abutments. And that's just a case illustrating how the connective tissue can be um, supported by those. So take home message really, if we're thinking about significant gains in volume, we can only really achieve this through connective tissue grafting. It's not a situation where you would contemplate using a xenograft like the mucograft uh, seal. The other key point here is not to let the case fall on its face at the end. So making sure that uh, at the prosthetic side, you have the appropriate emergence profile, very important to ensure you have a concave labial, uh, subgingival labial contour on your temporary crowns and also on your final crowns, particularly if you're using either collagen or connective tissue graft to provide space for that soft tissue. And uh, you can see here on this case where the 2-1 was uh, removed, flapless procedure, immediate placement, um, connective tissue graft, subgingival connective tissue graft, and a temporary crown on day zero. If we do this right, and we keep the emergence profile right, and uh, with the final restoration, even many years later, we can still have a nice, stable, highly aesthetic end, end result. So just some take home tips really to finish off the presentation. Really with immediate implants, it is challenging. You need an intact extraction socket. You need to try to undertake a flapless or minimal flap reflection in these cases. The implant obviously has to be in the right place three dimensionally, very important. You always graft the uh, osseous defect on the, on the buckle, you, on the labial aspect. You should always graft that with a slowly resorbable xenograft, small particulate size. Don't overgraft, uh, otherwise you increase your risk of infection um, and it won't, uh, the overgrafting won't achieve anything additional. 
Um, make sure that your healing abutments and your provisional crowns have a narrow emergence profile to support the volume of soft tissue that you're trying to achieve. And really, you know, depending on the case, make sure that you do use either, uh, you know, connective tissue graft or um, the uh, some form of collagen matrix such as the mucograft seal to help um, uh, optimize soft tissue healing um, around your immediate implant. And so, and as we touched on at the end, you know, if you're looking for, for volume, you really, uh, you really need to utilize the connective tissue graft. The, the volume of the tissue around the implant is important, um, uh, both initially to ensure a nice aesthetic outcome, but also long for the long-term health um, of the uh, implant itself. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I hope that you've enjoyed the lecture and look forward to uh, talk to you again soon. Thank you. Dear Michael, of course we enjoyed your lecture, has given us a very nice overview on immediate implants, which is a very complex procedure, as you correctly mentioned. Now I have a couple of questions, and I think you made the take-home messages were the essential aspects of immediate implant placement. You said you want to have an, an fully intact facial bone wall, an intact socket. Huh? Do yes. you, do you uh, differentiate between a thick buccal phenotype or thick wall phenotype and a thin wall phenotype? Or do you don't pay attention to that? I, I think that uh, as a general rule, um, I would be inclined to graft regardless. Um, however, there is some evidence, of course, that a thicker morphotype in terms of the alveolus um, could, could be more stable than a thinner than a thinner buccal plate um, but i think you know if the buccal plate uh, is difficult to obviously differentiate how much of a thick buccal plate is bundle bone versus alveolar bone and i yeah. think you know we can't do that by looking at it surgically so i guess my uh, my fallback position would be to graft to be on the safe side yeah, no, I think uh, the, uh, the, the grafting, I think, is not on dispute, you see, but they are surgeons, they say they only go for thick wall phenotypes to do immediate implants, and the others, they, uh, they wait six, eight weeks and go for early placement. That is the differentiation. Sure, I, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I guess it comes down to treatment philosophy a little, uh, and, and what type of implant for hand titchley you're using. Um, I think that... Um, if there's ever, ever any concern about the, uh, the likely outcome in terms of the hard and soft tissue healing, then one should always lean on the side of caution and perhaps do an early placement rather than an immediate. Don't be, don't be forced into the immediate just because it's nice to do. Yeah, I mean, I fully agree. An immediate placement, immediate restoration, of course, for the patient's comfort is by far the most attractive technique. I fully agree. Uh, I do about 5% only, I have to say I'm very careful. I did not do that up, up to 2017 because I've seen so many disaster cases in Bern coming from other sources where they overstepped the boundaries. Now, the second mm -hmm. point that you made is very clear. You do the grafting just inside the bone, so you're not using this dual zone augmentation technique by... Uh, what, they did, what they do in New York. You see, like Dennis Tarnow is proposing strongly. No, I don't personally subscribe to this technique. Um, I think I'm not sure that I'm really convinced by the evidence to date. I think that, um, you know, if we think about uh, placing the, you're talking about placing the xenograft on the outer aspect of the buccal plate, is that, do I have that correct? No, what they do, they, they actually, they don't use a xenograft because they have seen what you mentioned. They have seen an increased complication rate when you have xenograft. Right particles in the soft tissues so they then use actually an allograft which is better resolvable but what they what they claim is you see that you do actually you bump out the soft tissues with your filler so then there is no need for connective tissue grafting so and then uh, that somehow gets uh, part of the flap and then you get more volume that's the claim although uh, i fully agree with you i have not seen any evidence in a long term uh, from this technique as well you see mm -hmm. so you don't do dual zone augmentation no no okay. i do not do that another one is uh, how much do you consider the the the, the soft tissue phenotype 
and the, the smile line into your treatment planning because these are two significant risk factors for aesthetics as well, you see. Absolutely. I think they're very important things in terms of your treatment planning. And those are the first things that you obviously need to evaluate as part of your initial examination. So in a patient who is a highly aesthetic patient, who has a high lip line, I mean, the tolerance is there or the, 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 the tendency to push towards immediate placement, I think, should be less. You should approach or adopt a more conservative approach. And that goes doubly for cases where that patient also has a poor phenotype or a thin biotype. In those cases, you know, you may still, if you have an intact socket, you may still contemplate immediate placement, but perhaps you would not place an immediate provisional restoration, but rather spend that time and actually at the time of placement, augment the soft tissue to increase the volume and change the quality of that tissue. Okay. Another question, how do you control the correct axis of the implant? Because I see many times that immediate implants done by hand end up in too much inclination. And then you get a problem with the implant shoulder position in the crestal area. How do you control that? Look, there's that's, that's two things really. I think the first thing that is a common misconception is that you don't need to use a surgical template for an immediate implant. You know, many clinicians think this way. I think that's a mistake. I think the question really should be how experienced is this clinician uh, in terms of placing implants? So that's the first question. And really, even in experienced hands, I will still from time to time use a surgical template for an immediate implant if I believe that the placement is going to be challenging. Because there's no way, really, you lose a lot of your orientation when you've extracted the tooth, you've raised a flap. So you know, the tendency is to place palatal, okay. uh, we know this, um, for emergence, for screw access, for the prosthesis, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, if, if, if you're ever, you know, ever worried, the best way is to have some form of guidance. So this now could be either physical guidance through a template. In more recent times, we are now moving on to um, guided surgery using a, a GPS type approach where we actually have almost not a physical template, but we have a virtual template. So this is, uh, this is working well for immediates also. Although we are actually very pleased with uh, computer-assisted implant surgery, but using then a, a guide and using mm -hmm. digital technology. And with that one, we also prepare the provisional with uh, CAD CAM technique, so everything is ready when we do the surgery. So that yes. seems to be uh, also very nice a technique available today that helps to avoid this uh, malpositioning. Now, our last question is about the, the soft tissue augmentation. Is it correct that you use it either with a mucograft or with a, connect, uh, so with a CTG, you see? What's the percentage? You see, how often do you go for the connective tissue graft from the palate and how often do you think you can do it with uh, the, the mucograft? In terms of percentage, I would say that the majority would still be with connective tissue graft, to be honest, because, uh, you know, often these immediate implants are in the anterior aesthetic zone. Often, uh, in New Zealand at least, the biotypes seem to be more on the delicate side. So, by default, it's connective tissue graft. If the patient is a low aesthetic case, if they have a good gingival biotype, then I think those cases we can, uh, we can comfortably use uh, a, a collagen substitute such as the mucograft seal. Very good. Michael, it was excellent to have this topic on immediate implants so well presented, all the aspects needed, so we could also discuss them. Uh, we send you best. How, what's the time now in New Zealand? Oh, it's, it's late in the evening. It's coming up to 10, 10 in the evening now. 10 p.m. <laughs> yeah. I hope next year or probably the year after, I want to have another big trip to Australia, New Zealand, another four weeks. I, I had the chance to do that in 2008. It was a fantastic experience. Well, that's a long time ago. It's time to come back and Most see the Southern Island, you see. Okay. We, will, we will welcome you back with open arms. Okay, we will do that.